Ja, Ladies and Gentlemen, Mesdames und Monsieur, meine Damen, meine Herren, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to our webinar, to the last webinar in the 2024 edition of our webinar series about hydrogen. And this semester, or this winter term, we focused our webinar on hydrogen and hydrogen derivates. And as you might remember, we started in the 10th of January with the opening event where we discussed the possibilities and the needs and the significance of hydrogen derivatives, where we looked a little bit about the global hydrogen markets as well as the hydrogen transportation pros and cons. And then we looked a little bit more in detail about the different um, derivatives. So we had two webinar series or webinar evenings about ammonia transportation and the energetic use of ammonia, because this is at the moment, this option <clears throat> related to a, a, let's say hydrogen derivate, which is most widely discussed and seems to be a, one of the options with uh, huge market potential, especially on the background that when we talk about ammonia, that this is already in the market and it already the most important and the most widely produced, <clears throat> let's say, um, <clears throat> chemical compound based on hydrogen. So far on fossil fuel energy, mostly um, natural gas, but hopefully in the future based on green hydrogen. And then we discussed about the possibilities of um, <clears throat> methane, also a hydrogen carrier, <clears throat> where we looked about hydrogen methanation and the transportation of liquid, <clears throat> let's say methane in the form of LNG. This is what we um, <clears throat> discussed on the 7th and the 14th of February. And last week, ladies and gentlemen, we discussed about the production of long chain hydrogen derivates on one hand side methanol and on the other side fischer tropsch crude. And with this, <clears throat> let's say we discussed within this webinar series, the most important options which we see for the time being. Of course, there are more, of course, there are other possibilities, but for the time being, these are the ones which we or I personally see as the most important <clears throat> points. And based on this, it's my great pleasure now for today and for the last webinar in this series to introduce <clears throat> our <clears throat> night tonight with the comparison of hydrogen derivates and hydrogen supply options. And there it's my great pleasure first to introduce <clears throat> Lucas Sens. He is currently with Energy Exemplar and <clears throat> in the former days, in the old days, um, he has been part of Hamburg University of Technology and he will give us an outlook and an um, <clears throat> summary about comparison of different hydrogen supply options which is be a part of the research work which we, he <clears throat> did basically at Hamburg University of Technology. And then as the second part, we will have <clears throat> a presentation from Stefan Voss and Stefan Bube, both of them also <clears throat> um, from Hamburg University of Technology. And they will give us a comparison between alcohol to jet versus fischer tropsch crude <clears throat> processing. And with this, we finalize our webinar series with this last round. So, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the different organizer, which is on one hand side, the Tunisian um, Green Hydrogen Association, which is the university, the school of, uh, let's say, um, sustainable um, energies in Batna in Algeria, with <clears throat> Hamburg University of Technology as well as the um, VDI, the German Engineering Association. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this last webinar. And with this, I would like to pass over to Lucas Sens to give us his <clears throat> view about the um, comparison of different hydrogen supply options. So Lucas, the floor is yours and we are very much interested in your presentation. Perfect. Thank you very much, Martin. And um, also thank you very much for the invitation and also a warm welcome from my side. Um, 
yeah, I, first I will try to share my screen so you can follow my presentation. Just give me like a short moment for this. And now you should be able to see my full screen. And yeah, thank you very much, Martin, to give me the sign. And now we can just start like with the first topic of today's webinar. And as you can see with the title, it's about hydrogen and hydrogen derivative supply chains. As we have seen before, we have talked a lot about in the details about the different um, yeah, hydrogen carriers like ammonia, like methanol, but also uh, methane. And um, of course, also the elementary hydrogen options like gaseous hydrogen. And uh, in my session right now here, I would like to compare all these kind of different hydrogen carriers or even hydrogen derivatives based on an economic assessment. And what is very important for me also here to highlight, um, this kind of work is like um, the work from my time at TUHH. And it's not only my work, it's the combined work of, of Martin, Fabian and me. And yeah, I have the pleasure today to present our results. To don't lose too much time, I would like to start now like with the um, second slide. And um, yeah, here's just like a quick overview of the different uh, hydrogen conditioning options. We have heard about them already, I think, uh, in the very first webinar, which was the presentation from Fabian. And here, just a quick recap, like we have different options how we can condition our hydrogen to have like an increase of our hydrogen uh, volumetric energy density. So the first option here is like the physical conditioning. What does it mean? It means we always have like still elementary hydrogen. So we don't need to use another uh, molecule and um, therefore we can condition it if we compress it to like a more dense volume to have like a higher volumetric energy density. Um, and this is called the compressed gaseous hydrogen. And the other option is to cool it down to minus 253 degrees. And then we have like liquid hydrogen as a, yeah, as a liquid. And uh, the other option is the chemical conditioning. We can see here that we will need therefore another molecule because then we have like a chemical bound to another molecule. And here, yeah, not only for, for, from Martin's perspective, but I think um, from, from also from my perspective and uh, the perspective of the whole Institute, um, there are ammonia, LOHCs, methanol and methane um, are the most promising um, hydrogen carry options. And yeah, for each, um, for each uh, different option, we need like a, a molecule here for ammonia, for example, nitrogen um, to, to, to produce uh, ammonia. And for the liquid organic hydrogen carrier, um, we have like an organic compound where we, uh, which we are used to, to, to store our hydrogen. And for methanol and methane, we're using CO2 um, to, for the synthesis to methanol respectively methane. And uh, all this we do to increase our volumetric energy density. And now if we, um, if we compare this kind of energy density with each other, we can see like, yeah, very, very different results. Now here in this kind of figure, you can see here on the X axis, the gravimetric energy density. And here it's shown gaseous hydrogen as, at, at standard temperature and pressure. And what we can see, we have like a very high gravimetric energy density, which is around like 33 kilowatt hours per kilogram. And if you wonder here, this LHV means it's the lower heating value. So all the numbers we are showing also like here, it's always referring to the lower heating value. But now if we compare it to the volumetric energy density, which is again in kilowatt hours, per liter, we can see it's very, very low. And therefore we need this kind of uh, hydrogen conditioning, which is shown here, for example, for compressed gaseous hydrogen uh, on the pressure level of 350 bars. And we can see already that we can increase um, our vol en volumetric energy density to roughly one kilowatt hour per liter. Of course, we can have even higher pressure levels, for example, 700 bars, as we can see it like, for example, in, 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 in hydrogen vehicles. And uh, then we can also further increase our volumetric energy density yeah, to, to roughly 1.3, 1.4 kilowatt hours per liter. Now, this was the compressed gaseous hydrogen. Um, talking about the liquefaction of hydrogen, we can reach even a higher volumetric energy density, which is here shown. It's around, let's say, 2.4 kilowatt hours per liter, and therefore almost double than if we compress uh, our hydrogen. 
And um, we can see already like a significant um, volumetric energy density here for the liquid hydrogen carriers. Um, uh, for, sorry, not for the liquid hydrogen carriers, but for the liquid hydrogen. Now talking about the liquid organic hydrogen carriers, um, it's it's showing shown here. So this is like the volumetric energy density of the hydrogen, which is bounded to this kind of organic car hydrogen carrier. And we can see the volumetric energy density is lower than for liquid hydrogen, but higher than for compressed gas gaseous hydrogen. However, very interesting, we can see the gravimetric energy density is significantly lower because right now we do not only have elementary hydrogen, but we also have like another way bigger and heavier molecule, which we need to, to bind our, uh, to, to have uh, the hydrogen bound to this kind of molecule. And um, yeah, therefore we have like a lower gravimetric energy density. Okay, now talking about uh, the next option, here is shown um, the hydrogen which is bounded in methanol or which can be supplied by using methanol as an hydrogen, ca an hydrogen carrier. And we can see here that our volumetric energy density is significantly higher with uh, yeah, around five kilowatt hours per liter. And also our gravimetric energy density is higher than for LHCs. Now in comparison here, we can see the lower heating value of methanol itself. So when we do not consider the, the hydrogen in the methanol, but when we, um, when we use methanol itself as a fuel, so the hydrogen derivative itself. And then we can see here that the volumetric energy density is slightly decreased as well as also the gravimetric energy density, but still higher than for all the other options we have considered yet. Now, talking about synthetic natural gas, we can see here again on this kind of square, the hydrogen energy in this kind of natural gas. And we can see it's between um, the methanol and the other options we have considered when we're taking a closer look on the volumetric energy density. However, the gravimetric energy density is higher. And here in comparison to that, if we just consider the synthetic natural gas itself, we can see that we have like a significantly higher volumetric energy density, even as methanol, but also, um, yeah, a significant increase of our gravimetric energy density. And last but not least, here ammonia, again, the hydrogen in ammonia, and here second, uh, the ammonia itself um, uh, as an energy carrier, and we can see that the volumetric energy density as well as the gravimetric energy density is, is in the same area as here for methanol or um, for yeah, synthetic natural gas when we just consider the hydrogen, which is bounded here inside. Now we can see here, it's like a little bit confusing. Um, we can see on the one hand, like for elementary hydrogen, um, that the gravimetric energy density is significantly higher, but the volumetric energy density is like a little bit lower. So now the question arises here, okay, which kind of hydrogen carrier um, is the best option um, to supply our green energy? And this kind of question uh, we assessed uh, in our work uh, at the TOHH. And to do so as a first step, we need to define our hydrogen supply chain. And this I want to do with you right now here um, uh, on the next slide. And um, just first of all, I want to give you a broader picture of um, these kind of green energy carrier supply chains. So when we're talking about green energy carriers, as a first step, we always need green electricity. And therefore we considered here photovoltaics and wind power. And of course, if we want to produce our hydrogen, the first step, we need water. And then we need like the electrical power and the water in an electrolyzer to produce our hydrogen by splitting the, the water into hydrogen and oxygen by using this kind of electrical energy. And now in the second step or in the third step, we consider the conditioning. So this means we have here the liquefaction, for example, the compression or our synthesis to another carrier molecule. And therefore we would also need CO2 or nitrogen if we consider in this case, for example, uh, methane or ammonia. Now, after we have um, produced our hydrogen, after we have, con uh, have it conditioned it to, to increase the energy density, then we need uh, the transportation, um, which can be done here in our case, um, for example, by ships, but also by pipelines, if we consider long distance transportation. 
And then uh, the next step is the reconditioning, um, which means we, if we want to have like elementary hydrogen, uh, we need to, for example, have a cracking of our ammonia or um, a cracking of our methanol, or for example, a regasification of our liquid hydrogen. And so, so in the end, we always have then again, gases hydrogen. But which can be also considered that we don't crack our our um, our energy carrier like methanol or, or ammonia, but we use it itself as an energy carrier, we, and we can burn it directly, for example, in a turbine. So this is like the broader concept of these kind of energy carrier supply chains. And now on the next slide, I want to introduce like the exact energy supply chains we have accessed, uh, assessed uh, on, yeah, in, in our work and uh, from which I'm going to show the results uh, um, yeah, in, in a few seconds. So first of all, as I said, we always start with gaseous hydrogen and we always end with a gaseous hydrogen supply. So gaseous hydrogen production, and then in the end, gaseous hydrogen supply. To reach this, we can have here like the compression and a compressed gaseous hydrogen, hydrogen transportation per pipeline. Second step here is the liquefaction, which is needed when we have like a liquid hydrogen supply chain, then the liquid hydrogen tanker, and then in the end, the liquid hy hydrogen regasification. Another step here, or another supply chain is the LOHC supply chain. Here then we have like the heat rate hydrogenation as conditioning and the dehydrogenation as a conditioning. And instead of an LH2 tanker, we can just use like a conventional oil tanker for transportation. And very important for LOHCs, we need to have like a retransportation of our carrier molecule. Um, of the LOHC itself to use it again uh, to store our hydrogen and to transport it again to our hydrogen supply side. And um, now here the other options, ammonia. Uh, for ammonia, of course, then we have like a different um, uh, conditioning process. Here the Haber-Bosch synthesis, which we have assumed, uh, the ammonia liquefaction and the transportation, and then the cracking if we want to have compressed, uh, if we want, want to have gaseous hydrogen, or also the option of a direct ammonia supply as a green energy carrier. And uh, last but not least, here methane and methanol. Um, for, for, for both of these carriers, we need like, instead of a nitrogen uh, source, we need to have like, a, we need a CO2 source. And then of course here also, probably the well-known processes for you already to, to reach either the gaseous hydrogen supply, um, supply at the end, or to have like a element, um, elementary energy carrier supply of methane or methanol, um, and then we don't need the cracking. So these are the green energy carrier supply chains we have assessed in detail. And uh, before I'm going to show you the results, just like a quick overview, how do we navigate uh, there with our approach and assumptions? So what we're going to show, we, we show you a well to tank analysis. So from the production up to the supply um, to, to the consumer, we have um, taken into account like all the main cost drivers. Um, for the cost quantification, we are using the annuity method and uh, there our depreciation time always equals the technology lifetime. And other further important assumptions here that our weighted average cost of cap capital uh, are set to 6%. We always assume like a large scale technology rollout means for example, for liquid hydrogen, we assume like very, very large scale liquid uh, uh, hydrogen, uh, li hydrogen liquefier um, just because um, if we just would assume right now like this this kind of small scale uh, hydrogen liqu liquefier we would reach like very very high costs and in the future it's more 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 likely that there then we were going to have like very very big um, hydrogen liquefiers and the same is true for all the other processes and if we're talking about the time horizon you can see it here already the year 2035 is assumed for all our cost assumptions. All right, uh, now probably the most interesting part of this kind of presentation, and uh, these are the results. Um, so you can see here um, on the y-axis, we have the energy carrier supply cost in euros per kilowatt hour, always referring on the lower heating value. And now just to introduce you like the x-axis. Um, so first of all, we distinguish between the energy carrier category. So first of all, we have here the option of elementary hydrogen supply. So which means in the end, we always want to have like our pure gaseous hydrogen. So for example, if we're going to use methanol, we need to 
crack in the end the methanol and take the uh, hydrogen out of it and um, uh, yeah uh, and and not supplying the pure uh, uh, not supplying the the hydrogen derivative. If we want to supply the higher hydrogen derivative, so then in the end no cracking is is needed. Um, this is shown like in these kind of section. The second row here is um, the um, definition of our transportation option. So there are two options, either a pipeline transportation or a transportation per ship. And in the third row here, you can see our energy carrier option. CGH2 is the compressed gaseous hydrogen option, LH2 liquid hydrogen. Then here our synthetic natural gas, methanol, ammonia, and LOHCs as um, hydrogen carriers. And last but not least, here we have like different hydrogen transportation distances. So one time like 3000 kilometers and on the other hand, we consider like 15,000 kilometers of transportation distance. All right, um, so just to give you like a, an, an idea, what does it mean? For example, if we say here, we want to transport hydrogen as an SNG over 3000 kilometers per ship. And in the end, we want to have like elementary hydrogen. So this is how we can read this kind of figure. Or for example, here, we want uh, to have like a, a methanol supply over 50,000 15, kilometers of transportation distance per ship. And yeah, we don't crack the hydrogen, but we want to have the hydrogen derivative here. All right, now we are coming finally to the results. And here you can see uh, in the first section, the, the energy carrier supply cost for, uh, for a pipeline transportation of um, compressed gaseous hydrogen. And uh, we are around like, let's say 14 cents per, per kilowatt hour. And if we increase our transportation distance, we can see here like a very, very significant increase of our transportation cost. And this is due to the fact that we just have like a linear scaling um, um, for our transportation cost because for each kilometer more we need like more pipeline material and um, yeah also more uh, compression demand is needed and therefore we can see here like a very very high cost dependency um, uh, in terms of um, hydrogen transportation per pipeline. Meanwhile if we consider the liquid hydrogen transportation or supply option we can see like the cost dependency is not as big as for, for, for the pipeline transportation. However, overall the costs here are higher than for the compressed gaseous hydrogen transportation per pipeline. And why is it so? It's especially because we have like a high energy and um, a high investment expensive for the liquefaction. So here the conditioning of our hydrogen is way more expensive. And also in addition, we can see here that we're going to have like an additional hydrogen production cost. This is due to the fact, for example, for liquid hydrogen, um, we have so-called boil off losses. And when we going to lose like some kind of liquid hydrogen in our ship over the transportation time, then of course we need to produce more hydrogen to have in the end the same amount of hydrogen supplied and therefore here the hydrogen production costs are higher. Now, if we take a closer look um, to, 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 to SNG, methanol and ammonia, we can see like for all these kind of options that we have like higher cost than for, for the gaseous hydrogen transportation, but also for and in the case uh, compared to, to liquid hydrogen transportation. And um, this is due to the fact for, for methane and methanol, due to the reason that here, the, this kind of dashed um, pattern, which is the CO2 cost, that these kind of CO2 supply costs, they lead to like very, very high uh, overall energy carrier supply cost. Meanwhile, for ammonia, it's like a little bit different. Here, the nitrogen is not very cost intense. However, here, um, we, we can see um, the, the conditioning and reconditioning demand is higher. And also for all these kind of options, we can see also like for the liquid hydrogen an additional hydrogen production demand. Um, this is due to the reason here, not because of boil off losses, but because we, in the end, when we want to, to, to crack our chemical uh, um, uh, structure into hydrogen and CO2 or hydrogen and nitrogen, we need a lot of thermal energy. And therefore we need to use like a very large fraction of our energy carrier itself to, pro to provide these kind of um, yeah, thermal cracking energy. 
And a similar picture is also uh, can also be seen for LHC. However, overall, hydrogen supply costs by using LOHCs are even higher. And um, yeah, again, here we have like the additional hydrogen production um, cost due to, to, to cover the re reconditioning energy demands. Uh, and also we have re relatively high expenses for the hydrogen carrier material, especially if we have like a larger transportation distance. And now it's very interesting if we're going to say, okay, we do not want to supply just elementary hydrogen, but we want to supply just our hydrogen derivative. Means, um, I name it again, we uh, supply, our, supply our SNG or methanol or ammonia itself. So we do not need to crack out the hydrogen. And how does the picture change here? We can see for all the three options that the energy carrier supply costs are relatively low and just the transport uh, energy supply costs for, for the gaseous hydrogen supply per pipeline are lower than for these three options. And this is due to the fact that we're going to save the high thermal energy demand, which is needed for the cracking process. And uh, also here, um, uh, in addition, we can see that um, we still have like a significant cost driver for, for the CO2 if, if we consider a carbon-based um, energy carrier. And um, this is also very interesting because for ammonia, we can see that these kind of um, yeah, carrier costs, yeah, nitrogen, uh, are relatively low. So what can we take home here also as a message? If we have like very, very cheap um, green CO2 supply sources, then these kind of um, energy carrier supply options could be even cheaper and therefore also cheaper than ammonia. But if the CO2 supply costs are relatively high, then these kind of costs can also be increased. And therefore it's crucial in this case to have like low cost green CO2 supply sources. All right. And um, yeah, this was like a quick dive into our, our results of the assessment of uh, energy carrier supply chains. And um, yeah, now I just want to give you like, from my point of view, the, the four most important take home messages. And um, you can see here the first message and which just uh, states, okay, um, for shorter distances. And if you want to have like an elementary hydrogen supply, uh, the best option to go is uh, the gaseous hydrogen transportation per pipeline and costs will be likely lower than, or than 14 cents per kilowatt hour um, of hydrogen. Meanwhile, um, if we want to have like a shipping of, of, of hydrogen and in the end we want to have like again elementary hydrogen, then we can see way higher cost, especially if we consider like a carrier molecule uh, option and not liquid hydrogen. However, this can be again, again changed. If we use the hydrogen derivative itself, then this kind of cost can be lowered again significantly so that we are just a little bit higher than for the pure gases hydrogen transport uh, supply cost. And last but not least, uh, in the case of carbon-based energy carriers, here the carbon dioxide cost, they are the main cost driver uh, and therefore they show like a high potential to reduce further the cost of these kind of carbon-based energy carrier so supply options. And yeah, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And um, yeah, I'm giving uh, giving back to you, Martin. I'm also already looking forward for for the next presentation and for the next uh, for the for the discussion. But from now on, back to you, Martin. Okay, Lucas. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation and for this overview about the different provision chains and their assessment and their rating in between. So <clears throat> I think at least I learned that it is not that easy just to compare one with the other. You have to take quite a lot of care to compare apples with apples and not apples with plums and apples with X or whatever. Yeah. So thank you very much for this, Lucas. And thank you very much for also the very nice um, take home message. With this, I would like to continue in our webinar tonight and now <clears throat> like to introduce um, Stefan Voss and Stefan Bube. Both of them will give together now a presentation about Argo Docet versus Fischer Tropsch. As you might remember from the last webinars, 
this is indeed one option which is very much discussed, which route we should go and which route is most promising. And therefore, <clears throat> I ask, or we motivated both of them to give us an overview about this. And with <clears throat> this introduction, I pass over to you, Stefan, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I will start today. Thank, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, Stefan, my colleague Stefan Bruwe, and I would like to give a brief comparison of the Arcojo jet process and the Fischer-Tropsch process as a comparison um, of hydrogen derivatives in the form of long-chain um, hydrocarbons. Here, we would like to start with a little motivation. Um, these long-chain hydrocarbon products as a de hydrogen derivative um, can be, for example, nafta, kerosene, and diesel, for example. Uh, today, we will concentrate an, um, on the long-chain um, hydrocarbon in the form of kerosene. These can be produced out of various biomass-based and power-based resources. The, they are available to produce these. The biomass, consisting of oil, starch, sugar, or lignocellulosic um, content, serves as a basis for direct conversion into these hydrocarbons. However, these are um, dependent on the availability of these feedstocks. Electricity-based fuels uh, are produced via the production of hydrogen and the production of a uh, downstream production of synthesis gas to enable the su uh, subsequent synthesis of methanol, for example, of a Fischer-Tropsch crude. This leads to high potentials um, as only the water and the CO2 is required as a material feedstock. In addition, this is an independent on the entire feedstock and yet can utilize the hydrogen. The Fischer-Tropsch synthesis on the right-hand side and the alcohol to jet process route are therefore described in more detail on the next slides. As the latter is possible both via a synthesis route out of power-based um, resources and via the direct biochemical conversion out of biomass-based uh, feedstock, we will at first take a closer look at this um, methanol to kerosene process pathway or alcohol to jet process pathway. This alcohol to jet um, already consists of the um, of the alcohols. This can be methanol, ethanol, propanol or butanol, or even higher alcohols. Today, we are producing these alcohols, for example, over a synthesis step, where we're using hydrogen and carbon monoxide to produce our um, alcohol, for example, especially be done for the methanol production, via the biochemical production, where we uh, have a fermentation to alcohol, especially done for ethanol and butanol, for example. And we have the thermochemical production, where we have the hydroformulation, where we can produce already need an hydrocarbon and a hydrogen and carbon monoxide to produce propanol and even higher um, alcohols. We can use these alcohols already today, um, for example, directly as an alternative fuel solvent or in the food and beverage industry. We can produce out of these alcohols our drop in fuel by uh, hydrocarbon production via dehydration, organization, hydrogenation, and fractionation. And we can produce chemicals uh, out of these alcohols via the olefin production and the ba as a basis, for example, for polymers via the dehydration of methanol and ethanol, for example. Today, we would like to concentrate on the um, synthesis as a hydrogen derivative um, of methanol and the downstream drop-in fuel production for the hydrocarbon production to compare this process pathway with the, uh, with the Fischer-Tropsch process pathway. There, we would like to, um, to um, show the di different technical di uh, differences of the hydrocarbon production via the methanol and fischer trop route. We would like to show where losses occur in the process chain and where the param which parameters have particular influence on these process efficiencies. So we can start with an overall um, comparison of these both process pathways. When we compare these, and um, the pathways already st always start with an electricity based in an electricity based production with water, CO2, and electricity using carbon capture, for example, and electrolysis to provide pure CO2 and hydrogen. 
In the methanol pathway, the hydrogen and the carbon dioxide is directly converted to methanol, which builds the intermediate product by separating an additional water. In the fischer tropsch synthesis, um, there, the hydrocarbon formation is done in a single synthesis step. However, upstream, we need a CO2 activation. There, the hydrogen and CO2 is fed into the reverse water gas shift reaction to generate a conventional CO-rich synthesis gas. This synthesis gas is then converted into a diverse mixture of hydrocarbon chains, the so-called syncrude or e-syncrude. On the right-hand side, on the methanol pathway, the methanol intermediate is then entering the ethanol, uh, methanol to kerosene process pathway, where we then produce our hydrocarbons by dehydration and oligomerization. To produce our final product kerosene, we uh, need additional hydrogenation and fractionation. As the required hydrocarbon chains already exist in this fischer tropsch synthesis, we need there an um, upgrading processes by the hydro treatment processes to mainly changing fuel properties. In the following, we would like to look at both processes from hydrogen and carbon dioxide onwards. And at first, we start with methanol to kerosene pathway. So let's delve deeper into this methanol based process route. At first, we start with a hydrogen and carbon dioxide to produce in a heterogeneous catalyzed gas phase reaction our methanol. This can be done on the one hand side via the conventional production, which is not based on CO2. This is mainly based on CO rich synthesis gas with a high technology readiness level and huge capacities. But it can be already done too on the CO2 based synthesis, which is already implemented in large demonstration plants and small commercial, uh, commercial plants with capacities of around 10 tons a day. This is all, uh, shown on the right hand side here. Here, we can now see the reaction which will take place in the methanol synthesis. The first reaction is a direct CO2-based reaction for the CO2, and hydrogen is converted to methanol in water, which is an overall exothermic reaction. We can split it to two reactions by first reducing our carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide with an hydrogen and producing water, which is an endothermic reaction, and a higher exothermic reaction follow-up reaction where we produce our methanol by CO hydrogenation. All in all, this is then the overall exothermic reactions at temperatures between 200 and 300 degrees Celsius and pressures between 40 and 100 bars. We reach in this synthesis step very high selectivities and conversion, one, uh, conversions of around 45%. The uh, synthesis gas, which is not converted in the methanol synthesis, can be fed back to the reactor to achieve an overall high conversion rates of nearly 100%. This produced methanol is then entering the methanol to kerosene process pathway to produce our hydrocarbons. Thereby, we at first have to a uh, dehydration step where we form carbon bonds between the uh, methanol molecules and separating water. This so-called methanol to olefins uh, process pathway is more or less state of the art pro, uh, for the ethane and propane production, so the short chain olefins production. These short chain ole uh, olefins can then couple together to longer chain olefins in a, a step that's called oligomerization. There, uh, a hydrocarbon mixture is produced where the di di distribution depends on, for example, the distribution of the short chain olefins and of the uh, oligomerization technology, for example, temperature, pressure, catalysts. So longer chain olefins then have to be hydrogenated and fractionated to produce our final product, the kerosene fraction. This process pathway is now compared to the fischer tropsch pathway, where I will go in a little bit deeper now. In the fischer tropsch pathway, we, as called, uh, as, uh, as um, said before, we start again with the CO2 and hydrogen and the reverse water gas shift reaction to reduce our carbon dioxide with additional hydrogen to carbon monoxide, which is an overall endothermic reaction which will take place at 800 to 1000 degrees Celsius. So we need to provide very high temperature heat for this reverse water shift reaction at relatively low uh, pressures between one and 30 bars. 
this is a heterogeneously catalyzed gas phase reaction with a, a basic nickel catalyst, for example. This very high temperatures uh, and endothermic reaction um, has or only a technological readiness level of around six to seven. So not so high like in the methanol synthesis, for example. This synthesis gas, so this carbon monoxide based synthesis gas with hydrogen is then entering the fischer tropsch pathway. As we would like to produce a fuel, um, for example, a kerosene fuel, we are looking today at the low temperature fischer tropsch to produce high, uh, longer chain hydrocarbons. Therefore, we need carbon monoxide and hydrogen to produce our um, hydrocarbons and uh, water. This is all in all a very exothermic reaction where around 25% of the higher heating value is released in the um, fischer tropsch pathway. There will, uh, Stefan will show you um, the, um, the numbers for the reactions. Um, this catalytic reaction is take place on the gas and liquid uh, phase on a solid catalyst. So we have three phases and the um, synthesis product consisting of different products like paraffins, olefins, methane, cycloalkanes, and oxygenates, which is then the group of all products is then the called the E-synchrute where the distribution of the chain links is very dependent on the process parameters. On the, in the low temperature fischer tropsch we have temperatures around 180 to 250 degrees Celsius and pressures between 15 and 60 bar. 60 bar. We have different uh, catalyst types, reactor types. And in this case, our target product is the long chain hydrocarbons. For example, the kerosene and diesel fractions and the even longer waxes. Here on the right hand side, you can see such a uh, distribution of um, uh, fischer tropsch synthesis product. The short chain products, for example, C1 to C3 products can be reformed because these are not uh, in the fuel uh, chain links. The fuel chain links are between the C4 and, for example, C20 hydrocarbons. The longer hydrocarbons, C2021 plus, um, needs, uh, th these are the waxes of the product. These have to be again hydro treated and hydro cracked to be used as a hydro, um, as a fuel component. So this can be seen on the next slide, where we have the overall hydro treatment step, which can be separated in different hydro uh, processes. For example, the hydro cracking, where the waxes are cracked with additional hydrogen to short chain or shorter chain hydrocarbons, which are then in the um, fuel links. The hydroisomerization is branching these molecules to form isoparaffins, and we have additional hydrogenation and fractionations for the saturation of olefins, for example, and the rectification of the different fractions. The hydrocracking and isomerization are thereby to improve the product yield and the overall product quality. The hydrogenation and the fractionation is then needed to fulfill the overall fuel specification. And with this is then the final product of Fischer Tropsch kerosene is produced. And um, with that, I would now hand over to my colleague Stefan for the overall process pathway comparison. Thank you, Stefan. Also a warm welcome from my side. We will now have a more comparative view on both overall processes, mainly regarding an energy perspective. The results that we will show are based on an simulation-based technical analysis that we did at the Institute. And we are here starting with the fischer tropsch pathway energy flow diagram. So you see here all energy flows of the fischer tropsch pathway relative to the overall energy input. The chemical flows are related to the higher heating value here in this diagram. And when we now first focus on the fischer tropsch synthesis section with the reverse water gas shift reaction and the fischer tropsch reactor, we see that especially the reverse water gas shift reactor requires a high amount of high temperature heat. This heat is on the one hand needed for the reverse water gas shift reaction itself. And on the other hand, it's needed for the reforming of light hydrocarbons, which are fed back from the um, Fischer-Tropsch reactor to the 
reverse water gas shift reactor as in syngas recycle. So this high temperature heat above 900 degree Celsius um, is later released in the fissure trop reactor, however, here on a much lower temperature level of around 200 degrees Celsius. So no direct heat integration is possible here, so we require external energy. Another point that I would like to mention is that synthesis gas recycle is, of course, possible, but it's not possible to directly recycle everything to the fischer tropsch reactor since already built hydrocarbons do not, um, there is not a further chain growth of these hydrocarbons, so we need a reforming to synthesis gas in the reverse water gas shift reactor to use them again for fissure trops crude production. So recycle is possible, not directly to the fissure trops reactor, more to the reverse water gas shift reactor. If we now have a look at the overall energy inputs and outputs, we see that the main energy input, of course, here is the hydrogen, which makes up about 90% uh, of the total energy input. Less than 1% is required for the hydro treatment. Main part is for the synthesis gas production. Another energy input, which I already mentioned, is the uh, higher heat, uh, those, uh, the high temperature energy, which we require for the heating of the reverse water shift reaction. And uh, minor energy input is then below 2%. This is the energy that we require for the compression of the synthesis gas, um, mainly for the CO2 compression and the uh, recycled gas compression, since the fischer tropsch reaction occurs at a temperature level of slightly above 20 to 30 R. So for hydrogen from conventional electrolyzers, no further compression is required here. Having a look at the overall outputs, we see that the target product kerosene here shows an energy efficiency of 49%, which means that 49% of the overall energy input is here in the form of the targeted kerosene. With the addition of diesel and NAFTA, we come to a total product efficiency of 67%, also here relating to the higher heating value. What we cannot see on this diagram, what I would um, like to mention is the carbon efficiency. So the amount of carbon which is bound into the targeted products. And this here for the overall, for the total product, so NAFTA, kerosene and diesel um, is 99%. So we have very high um, material efficiency for the kerosene, it's 72%. So now the same on the next slide for the methanol pathway. Diagram looks a little bit different. Um, let's focus here again first on the section where the hydrocarbon chain growth occurs. So the area is now highlighted. It is the oligomerization section, like already mentioned by Steffen. So here, the product of the methanol to olefin reaction is set to the oligomerization section. Here, the olefins, which are the monomers for the reaction, um, are oligomerized and then um, further passed to the hydrogenation. However, the fraction which is too low for the target kerosene, too small for the target product kerosene, um, so the light olefins can be directly fed back to the oligomerization reactor, which is an advantage since we do not need additional energy here for reforming or something like that, um, since those olefins can directly fed back to the oligomerization section. So this is an advantage. However, um, accumulation of saturated hydrocarbons, which are not oligomerized, um, can occur in the synthesis loop and therefore we require a purge stream. And yeah, the amount is relatively high, depending mainly on the methanol to olefin reactor selectivity. So to avoid this accumulation, um, we require a purge, which leads to losses. When we now consider the overall energy inputs and outputs, we see that here as well, um, hydrogen is the biggest energy input, more than 94% of the overall energy input based on the higher heating value is related to hydrogen. We require more hydrogen for the hydrogenation since all products from the oligomerization are olefins and therefore we require more hydrogen for saturation. 
Then we require 6% of the overall energy input for the compression of synthesis gas and recycle gas. This higher amount compared to the fischer tropsch pathway is due to the higher pressure level of the methanol reactor. So we need additional hydrogen compression and we have a lower conversion in the methanol reactor, especially for the direct carbon dioxide based conversion. Um, therefore, we require also more energy here for the recycle. However, the big advantage here, since all processes, all reaction processes of this pathway are exothermic processes, we require no external heat. So heat integration can provide all the heat requirements inside this process. Regarding the products of this pathway, we can see that we have a higher kerosene selectivity. So regarding the energy as well as the carbon efficiency compared to the fischer tropsch pathway, so the overall process is more selective for kerosene, which is targeted here. However, the diesel fraction and the naphtha fraction are quite lower. So the total product efficiency is lower regarding both the energy efficiency and the carbon efficiency. So on the next slide, we will already find um, the, the parameter variation. So since all this process assumption in the overall process pathways um, depend on, for example, the technology provider or the operation conditions. Um, so we write a few parameters, um, very sensitive parameters or important parameters or uncertain parameters for both pathways. And we see here for the fischer tropsch pathway, the chain growth probability alpha, which was the right. And we will also write the behavior of the hydro cracking. So on the x-axis, you see the chain growth probability. And with the different colored lines, you see the different hydro cracking behaviors. On the y-axis, you see the energy efficiency regarding the total product, which are the dotted lines, and regarding the kerosene fraction, which are the solid lines. So maybe the key message from this diagram is that even if the highest straight run kerosene efficiency for the fischer tropsch pathway is at 0.85% chain growth probability, sorry, 85% chain growth probability. So meaning that within a straight run process without hydro cracking and recycling, here the highest kerosene fraction is formed. We see regarding the overall process that at higher chain growth probabilities, higher efficiencies regarding the kerosene as well as regarding the total product um, occur. So, and depending on the hydro cracking behavior, so roughly said um, regarding the selectivity of the hydro cracking, we see that in the different hydro cracking scenarios, this alpha value um, goes up to more than 90%. So the optimum here regarding kerosene efficiency can lie between 90%, 95%. The same we did for the um, methanol pathway. And here we see a much wider distribution. We write on the one hand, also the chain growth prob probability of the oligomerization, which of course are lower since the monomers are larger. And so we need less chain growth to reach higher molecules. And what we also write were the all, uh, already mentioned selectivities of the methanol to olefin process. So the amount or the percentage of olefins that are formed in the methanol to olefin process. And this is the main, mainly important parameter, the most important parameter for the methanol pathway. So we see that as of course at higher selectivities for olefins, we reach higher efficiency. Um, and when we look for the chain growth probability, we see that there the higher efficiencies especially regarding kerosene efficiency um, are at lower chain growth probability since we can recycle the light olefins just back. And then we just use the um, kerosene or the olefins that are in the kerosene fraction. So here, uh, lower chain growth probabilities are favorable in the analyzed concept. So with this, now we come to the um, conclusion of our presentation. So <clears throat> maybe regarding the 
comparison that we've seen on the last slides, we can um, conclude that the fischer tropsch pathway enables higher total product efficiencies. However, the methanol pathway is more selective regarding kerosene. And the thermodynamic advantage of the methanol pathway is that all processes or reaction processes are exothermic um, is exceeded by the byproduct losses in the methanol pathway. So a higher efficiency is in the methanol pathway only reached um, when the same carbon efficiency is uh, reached for the kerosene fraction, for example. Then regarding some general aspects, um, we can compare both processes in terms of technology readiness level. Both process pathways are from our point of view similar here in the fischer tropsch pathway, the reverse water gas shift reaction has the lowest um, technology readiness level. For the methanol pathway, all single technologies are already on a commercial um, level available. However, the combination for a kerosene maximized production um, hasn't been performed or demonstrated on a commercial level. So we assume both pathways are relatively similar. Regarding general um, infrastructure and handling, we see slight advantages for the methanol pathway since we have methanol as an intermediate which is a worldwide traded and um, transported and handled um, basic chemical. However, in the, in the fischer tropsch pathway, also we handle thin crude, but the wax fraction, of course, uh, has further requirements for handling. Regarding the flexibility, um, flexibility is a very wide um, word. However, when we consider here flexibility in terms of production, we can see that in the methanol pathway, we have on the one hand methanol, which is a worldwide traded basic chemical, uh, chemical which can be um, which can be used here. We have olefins in the production process, which is also required in the chemical industry. And then of course the kerosene, which is again um, a needed molecule on a, on a green basis. And then regarding process flexibility, we can also compare both pathways. And here the methanol synthesis is more um, flexible compared to the fischer tropsch pathway. So we see also advantages here for the methanol pathway. Of course, both pathways are very important and we cannot just say that one is much better than the other one. We just wanted to give um, a short overview for both pathways and we are happy um, for questions afterwards. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I think we will hear us later at the questions section. Yeah, Stefan and Steffen, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. So I understood from the presentation that there is no silver bullet. There is no, let's say, highway yeah, to say to go one route or the other. I understood that at the end of the day, I mean, I would say we need both if we would like to um, fulfill the task to defossilize our global energy system. Was this, maybe you can stop the presentation at this stage, and then maybe we can have a very short round table um, <clears throat> to all of us. We have learned from Lucas that um, we have lots of different possibilities to transport hydrogen in derivatives and with the different pros and cons. And we have learned from Stefan and Steffen that <clears throat> basically um, there are different routes which have some pros and cons, but there is no silver bullet. So therefore, from my point of view, the question is popping up, what is the best when you, for example, would like to import hydrogen to Europe, maybe from North Africa, or maybe from Australia, or maybe from South America, if you would like to import this, what is the best way? Do you produce methanol in Patagonia and transport the methanol and further process it here? Or do you, <clears throat> let's say, transport the liquid hydrogen to, let's say, Germany or Hamburg and process it here to hydrocarbons? What do you think is the best way to go? Maybe we can have a statement from all of you. And maybe, maybe we start with um, <clears throat> our colleague from Italy. And, and then further go down the road 
to <clears throat> the <clears throat> colleague from Hamburg and the other colleague being on holiday. So, Lucas. All right. Um, I would say it depends how do you define the best option. I mean, if it in terms of, of uh, hydrogen supply cost or of energy carrier supply cost, of course, it's, it's best if we would um, produce our methanol already at the uh, location of production. So you mentioned Australia or, or um, South America it would be the best to not only produce the hydrogen and ship the hydrogen here, but already produce also uh, the methanol there if we have like a low cost CO2 supply source. And um, because transportation costs of methanol are way lower than for, for elementary hydrogen. Um, however, the first if was already, if we have like um, a low cost green carbon source, um, the picture can change if we would have like somewhere else, maybe a, a low cost um, green uh, carbon source, but most of the time, CO2 transportation is, is lower in cost than um, the elementary hydrogen transportation. And uh, the other if is also like from respect perspective of Germany or, or Europe, um, if we want to have like, like all these kind of um, heavy industry, if we want to have it shifted everything um, back to other country uh, uh, to other countries uh, where we have like solar radiation or if we want to keep also like this kind of industry here here in, in Germany or in Europe so there are a lot of questions but from a point of a purely economic assessment how we did it always best to uh, produce and transport the energy carrier as he wanted as as uh, final um, for, for final consumption okay Stefan Yes, yeah, thank you. I think uh, Lucas already said a lot of uh, good points, maybe to add only one point. So if we are considering especially the hydrocarbon production, then of course, if we uh, produce, um, for example, a kerosene fraction or diesel fraction, then we can um, use the infra infrastructure that is already today implemented for the crude oil industry, which already helps to um, ship, for example, kerosene fractions and uh, diesel fractions as a hydrocarbon usage. So not not only to produce an hydro a hydrogen then in Germany, for example, but to use the hydrocarbon as an energy carrier directly in the um, aviation sector, for example, in Europe. Okay, thank you very much, Stefan. Um, I think this was already a well conclusion uh, from Lucas and Steffen, so I think I have nothing to add. Um, we should always consider um, green hydrogen, where the green hydrogen, where the energy, and then we should ship what we require here in Germany. So this is the thing I would yeah, also conclude from an economic perspective. Okay, thank you very much. So. Um... <clears throat> I mean, due to the fact that this is the last the last webinar, so I would like to come now slowly to an end. And maybe let's say one final statement from all of you with the same order I would propose is um, if we would like to have such provision chains, let's say realized or happen or <clears throat> be uh, um, <clears throat> realized in the years to come, what is the most important measures which has to be taken place that such provision chains develop and such an industry develops that we, for example, produce methanol in, let's say, South America and we produce fisher tropsch crude maybe in Australia or we produce liquid hydrogen maybe in North Africa and transport it up to here. What I really think is uh, has the highest or significant leverage to, let's <clears throat> um, say, support the development of such provision chains. How do you see it, Lucas? Um, from my point of view, the most important um, driver would be like a very strict um, CO two certificate market. So we we would need just we need to have like. Um, yeah, CO two certificates available, so which then builds like a relatively high price for for CO two, and if this is applied on all the sectors, I think this would be like a very big um, driver to 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 go into uh, renewable fuels, and uh, because otherwise, at least for 
for the, for the time being, the fossil fuels might be cheaper than the renewable fuels. So I think effective CO2 pricing, from my point of view, is a very, very important uh, a tool to achieve like climate uh, neutrality. Okay, thank you much. Um, Steffen? Yeah, so from my point of view, it's more or less the same. Like um, a CO2 uh, pricing is, I think, very relevant. And um, I think it should be implemented more or less in every sector. So not only in the transportation sector, for example, and in the energy sector for the um, heating of the houses, uh, even in the chemical sector, because there we using the hydrocarbons too as a um, material component. And therefore, we need... Um, there are the um, measures and the uh, quotas too to produce an overall system and producing green molecules there. Yeah. Thank you very much, Stefan. Yeah, I think again, I can just agree. So we need an honest price for fossil energy carriers um, on the one hand, and then uh, we require sustainability reg regulations. Um, maybe worldwide so we have a good basis to know what is sustainable and what is not sustainable and i think these are two very important points for the future okay thank you very much um so maybe my final comment to this is of course i mean i i, I agree that we need a certain economic pressure that this happens and the co2 tax is of course a good a good um, possibility but on the other hand side i mean and this is what I have to say as a professor at the university. Of course, we also need some, um, let's say, further research that we understand some <clears throat> processes in a better way that we can optimize some processes to make the overall system cheaper and <clears throat> that we, uh, let's say, increase the overall efficiencies. Because, I mean, at least from my point of view, there's still some improvement potentials given and some <clears throat> optimization potentials not exploited for the time being. So, with, uh, having said this, I um, would now like to come to the end of our webinar series in this winter term. So I already stated in my beginning of this webinar um, <clears throat> tonight that let's say we have made a quite interesting journey throughout the different um, <clears throat> let's say, um, derivates. And um, this webinar series has been shown that, let's say, there is a lot of knowledge there and we can learn a lot of um, aspects from the <clears throat> fossil fuel energy um, because most or part of this, what we need for a green energy system is already developed and is there. So <clears throat> from that point of view, I think this was a very positive view what we have learned in this winter term. With this, I would like to terminate our <clears throat> webinar series for this winter. And before I wish you a beautiful evening, I just would like to thank all the presenters in this webinar series for their very nice and very fruitful and very interesting presentations. And <clears throat> to all of you, um, <clears throat> there is a chance that you still can might have a look at the different presentations. They are still available. If you have registered here in this webinar, then you can have a look at in, at in um, <clears throat> YouTube. And <clears throat> of course, I would like to thank especially the speakers from tonight, which is Lukas Sens, it's Stefan Voss, and it's Stefan Bube to give a presentation here. And before I terminate, of course, I would like to thank also Felix Mendler and Wolfram Tuszewicki for taking care that technology-wise and organizational-wise, everything works very smoothly and very nicely. We don't have any fallout and no problem that we are offline. So thank you very much again for this. And <clears throat> to all of you listening out there, wherever you are, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for listening to this webinar series. And we will think about if we, let's say, make a reloaded version in the next winter term, but this is still not decided. And we will inform you right on time if we go forward or not. With this, thanks again to everybody and also thanks again to the different organizers and the different organizations. And with this, 
I wish everybody a beautiful evening. Enjoy yourself and enjoy the summer and hopefully or maybe we will see each other again in the next winter. So,